right. It looks like we are live. How is everyone doing today? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and today on this very special live stream, I am joined by a good, fr a good friend of mine, uh, Adobe colleague and former evangelist colleague as well. You know him, you may love him, I certainly do. His name is Carl Soule, and he's joined here, coming to us live from the Adobe Santa Monica studios. How's it going, Carl? Hi, Jason. Yeah, glad to be here. Um, you know, it's a beautiful day in uh, Santa Monica where we've got our uh, edits, the edit studios that I'm coming to you live from. Awesome. So what I thought we would do today for everyone, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions about really high end workflows and working with multiple cameras. And even though it comes up occasionally, metadata, right? And this is kind of one of those, it's one of those things that people are just, they just need to know more about because there's so much that you can do in Premiere when you use metadata, particularly if you're working across multiple cameras and you just, you've got a lot of footage and a lot of stuff to ingest and deal with. And that's pretty much what you're going to talk about today, right? Yeah, what I thought I'd take a moment and talk about, um, we, we deal with this a lot, particularly with people who are independent filmmakers. Um, you know, the, the finishing process in Hollywood oftentimes involves taking the edit that you've done in Premiere Pro and sending the sound off to be mixed someplace. You know, if you have the budget, you know, a big location like Skywalker Sound will do your final sound mix for you. Um, the same thing with color. You know, while we have all the tools inside of Premiere Pro for uh, what most people like to do, there is sort of a, a cachet and a brand of, you know, sending something to a place like Technicolor. Yep. And in a lot of cases, um, the way this can be done and the way the information is tracked and the way your editing files get relinked to the original camera files, which might be 6K or 8K, mm -hmm. um, it, it's all done by tracking metadata. And you need to have that information so that the files link up correctly. And it's one of my biggest pain points when I talk to an independent filmmaker and you know, the film's really taking off and they've started to get distribution and they're really excited. And now they have the budget and they're going to get a good final sound mix from, you know, somebody on a sound stage, or they're right. going to have the color done by like a high end colorist. And then they go to send the files off and nothing links up and they're wondering, well, wait, what happened? Why is this, you know, and it can create a lot of work at the end of the process if you don't handle your files the correct way to begin with. Right. And this is not a unique thing to Premiere Pro. This is a unique, this is something that you have to deal with no matter what NLE you're working with. Right. And there have become some standard workflows for being able to handle this. And uh, we're just trying to get the word out for people that particularly if you're working on, you know, a passion project, you've got a feature film that you're going to cut in Premiere. Um, you're going to do everything to uh, get started and get, you know, your files for test screenings and stuff directly out of Creative Cloud. But you want to kind of leave that option of being able to go um, outside of Creative Cloud, and you know, if if somebody wants to pick up and you know do a final sound mix, you know, on a big sound stage at the Sony right. lot or something like that, you want to be able to have that option. Awesome. So what what I want to show you is um, it's just some of the tips and tricks on on how to make that happen, and uh, it, a lot of it has to do with making sure your files are handled correctly at the beginning of the process, right. um, so that uh, all that information, that rich metadata information, is there things can be linked up properly as you move further down the chain. Um, awesome. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, Carl. So as always here, I'm going I'm to switch over to you, but let's just give a couple shouts to all the many people from all over the world watching us. You've got Hugo Vega, Rogelio Tejeda Victoria from Mexico, Amy Schiavo, great to see you as always, Frederick Clever, Paolo Marquez from Portsmouth, Vinicius wow. Lima from Brazil, and then Carl, you've got some fans here coming to you live on YouTube. Carl, they say this is a pleasant surprise. He is a Jedi in the editing world. That's the <laughs> Trinity Project, Inc. So you got some fans out there. Leonardo Favre Loretto, great to see you. Many of us coming. Hey, hey, Desiree. We've got Cavell, Neptune, ASN83, and Tim Matthew, among many others, joining us on Twitter Periscope. So I'll tell you what, Carl, I'm going to send it over to you. I'm going to switch over to your screen and awesome. uh, kind of let you take it away and begin doing your thing. And uh, for everyone listening and watching, I'll be in the chats here. So if you've got questions for Carl, you can feed them to me. I can feed them to Carl, or I can try and answer them in the individual chats. Also, you've got some shouts from Vincent Schilling and Wesley Jones. So uh, whenever you're ready, Carl, take it away. All right. So uh, I'll be doing a little bit of cutting back and forth uh, to my camera when, when I need to kind of talk to you about some of these things. Um, and I, I will admit what I'm going to cover 
isn't necessarily the most sexy parts of Premiere. You know, we are talking about words like metadata, and I know for some people that's just like, oh, but it's important. And uh, it's not that hard to do things the right way. And it's just gonna avoid any pain points that you might have further down the road. So I'm gonna jump into Premiere here. And uh, before I actually start to load anything, we're just looking at, a, at an empty project in Premiere here, a blank canvas, if you will. Uh, one of the first things that I wanted to point to is when we talk about the files that come from our cameras, many, many times the files have these crazy file names. And I know it's the job of a lot of assistant editors to go in. Once you import these files into Premiere, you start going through and you know renaming them based on things like scene and take and whatnot. But no one really wants to look at these file names to begin with. Um, the other thing about this is, uh, you know, if you're dealing with multiple cameras, if you have like A camera and B camera footage and you need to create multicams, you want to be able to do that in one quick and easy step. Uh, when I talk to assistant editors in, uh, in Hollywood in particular, you know, they're on such a time deadline. They've got to try and get the files in immediately from wherever they're coming in from set, you know, a DIT, somebody who is taking the original camera files, making backups, making backups of backups, making a copy that's maybe a lower resolution for editorial purposes. Um, they're doing all this work and then they hand off a drive or they hand off a link to download the day's uh, shots. Um, no assistant wants to go through and take 80 shots and have to rename 80 clips at a time. And that's where a special file format comes into play. Um, something that the industry uses to kind of keep a, a master log of all of the metadata of all the shots is a special tab delimited uh, text file called an ALE. Um, an ALE file looks kind of like this. It has a bit of uh, header information at the top of it. But then basically what we're looking at is a spreadsheet. Um, and the cool thing about this spreadsheet is it not only tracks the original file names of the clips on disk, it also allows for a producer or somebody on set to come up with the names of the clips that they want to use during the editing process. Now, I want to stress, you never want to rename the names of the clips on disk unless you've got you know, different cameras where you're dealing with duplicates. You always want to be able to link back to the original files. Um, and so you know, the idea of like renaming a, a, a clip with that crazy reference name to you know, scene one, take one, it means it's going to be more difficult to link back later if you have like a higher res copy that you want to go back to. So it's important to understand that these names that I'm talking about here um, these are the names that are going to show up inside of Premiere, um, but the name of the file on the drive stays what it was coming out of the camera or it matches to uh, the original file that came out of the camera. So not a lot of people outside of Hollywood know that you can import an ALE file strictly by uh, just, just double clicking inside your project bin. So if I just double click here and say, I want to import an ALE file, I can very quickly come in and just choose the ALE file that I want to use, import that in. And instead of having to see those camera names and go through and rename 80 shots, I've already got the, uh, the, the scene and the, uh, the camera and the camera names. I've got the editing name that I actually want to work with already inside of uh, Premiere Pro. So that just saved me a bunch of time. Now there is one additional step that I have to do here. Um, the ALE file does come in offline. So there is an additional step of just saying, you know, I need to link one of these files together. So really quickly I can do that um, just by finding where my media is stored on my shared storage. Just select that one clip and all of my shots have now come in for the day and they're all linked and they have all that extra rich information associated with them from the ALE file. Now, the other great thing about an ALE file, you know, you don't need somebody who is an expert in video production to be able to add additional columns to an ALE file, to be able to add additional metadata information. So if I am in the process where I've now imported these clips and maybe I start going in and doing some additional work with these files, if I suddenly realize that I'm missing some important metadata information, I would either need to manually type it in for each one of these files, 
or I could have the producer do it and give me an updated ALE. So it's, it's a big time saver again by using that ALE file as sort of the master uh, location for all of this rich information, things like log notes, uh, keeping track of the time code information. Um, you know, the ALE file becomes that one-stop shop for uh, your source of truth. Um, and that's also going to make it easy when you go to link up these files to like the high-res footage from the camera later on. So right now, if I jump back over to Premiere Pro, um, I've got some additional columns that I've opened up here. And Premiere can actually display a lot more metadata information than it typically has. So there's a metadata display panel that you can bring up simply by right-clicking on this header here inside the project bin and choosing metadata display. And from here, I can add additional columns that make them visible um, inside of Premiere Pro. So I've added some columns for color information. Um, there are some special color values that are used in, in uh, film and television, something called CDL values, that's a color decision list, um, something called a LUT. This is a, uh, like, a, like a color look that was uh, developed uh, to provide the specific look from the camera. Most of uh, Hollywood is shooting in uh, with cameras that record everything in a very flat uh, color space so that it can be graded and you've got a lot more room to push and pull later on. Jason, I know you've covered that in the past with, uh, you know, kind of using Lumetri as a way of uh, taking that flat kind of generic looking footage and making it look, yep. uh, look really pop on screen. Yep, so absolutely. It, in a lot of cases, when we work in Hollywood, um, they actually bake some of that information into the editing files. So there's a different team of people that is handling taking the cards out of the camera, putting them uh, into a reader, copying them off, and then running them through a transcoder like Adobe Media Encoder, where they add that LUT. So it's kind of the ProRes file that ends up being edited, already has some color information uh, baked into it. And it's important to track that because uh, the colorist who's going to do work on the original files at the end needs to know the names of the LUTs that were used, uh, the names of the color files that were used um, at the beginning of the process. So here I've got an example where I don't have any of that information. It's, uh, it's actually been, uh, it, it wasn't added in the, uh, in the ALE file to begin with. So how do I fix this? Well, if I select all my files, go to Clip, Update Metadata. This allows me to point at an updated ALE file. And that updated ALE file can add back in that information. So let me do that one more time. I'll choose Update Metadata. And let me add in the one with the CDLs. And what this will do is actually add that information back in where I'm clicking on the wrong file here. I can, I can feel it. I can tell this is an operator error issue. All right, you're gonna have to trust me on this. I just, just tried this just a moment ago. It was all doing what was needed. And now all of a sudden I've broken it. Okay, so the idea is by having this updated ALE file, I can select it. Um, and it will actually add in additional information into these different metadata columns. And so by doing this, um, that ALE file kind of becomes, again, that standard center of truth where if we add any additional information, if a producer goes in and adds log notes, descriptions, um, we can use the update metadata command to actually bring that information in all in one go for that day's uh, dailies. And it's uh, one of these workflows that we use over and over again within Hollywood, um, within uh, a lot of film and television production, because as these files are coming in, you just don't have the time to type it in. So if you're not familiar with ALE files, it's definitely something to check out. And if you wanna generate ALE files from uh, Premiere Pro itself, you can uh, select a series of files in your bin. I'll just show that real quick here. I've got all these files selected. So if I needed to generate a new ALE file, if I simply choose File Export, ALE actually stands for something called Avid Log Exchange. And by choosing this, I can save out a new .ale file so that all of the metadata that I've added inside of Premiere Pro 
can then be stored in this uh, tab delimited spreadsheet that I can open up and I can modify in a, a text editor or something like Excel or Google, um, uh, the Google spreadsheet tool as well. So it's just a really, really nice thing to do. And again, by doing this, it's gonna ensure that the correct metadata comes across. And this opens up all kinds of workflows with uh, dealing with things like um, multicams and particularly how you sync up your files. And I wanna talk about that also because this is also another pain point that we sometimes see when we talk about these uh, the, the, the term for being for handing off your project for final sound mix or for final color in Hollywood, we call that a turnover. And these turnover workflows, um, again, we see people having challenges with this. And one of those challenges is just how they synchronize uh, the picture and sound. So what we're looking at here today, um, I've got footage from my camera that is... Um, there is no sound associated with this, but the footage does have time code. And I also have a series of these multi-channel WAV files down here um, that have multiple microphones. I think either four or five microphones in different cases here. And what I need to do is quickly sync these up. Um, and I'm going to do it all in one quick pass here. In fact, I'm going to make sure that I have everything selected um, inside of my bin here. Now, a lot of people, uh, when they go to do synchronization of their multicam files, they use an older function called uh, uh, merge clips. Merge clips, we don't recommend it if you plan on using a sound turnover. In fact, even if you only have one camera and one sound file, we actually are recommending using multicam. And the reason for this is multicam will hand off all of the metadata information for the sound file and for the picture file, whereas Merge Clips creates kind of a, a video only metadata situation. And if you're trying to hand off the audio to a post house, there's a lot of extra work going through uh, trying to correct for that. So if you do think you're going to do your final sound mix elsewhere, um, multicam is the way to go. And the other benefit is what I'm about to show you here. If you've gone through and synchronized uh, one set of clips at a time, you're in for a treat because what you can do with multicam is I've got all kinds of clips selected here. I've got at least nine different takes here looking at the audio files. Um, I've also got A camera and B camera in this situation. What I'm going to do is select everything, right click and say create multicamera source sequence sync this based on time code. And I'm also going to turn on this little setting here. This is gonna help me see if anything did not synchronize properly. And I'm also going to set my audio synchronize or sequence settings here to choose camera one. Now, camera one has a little kind of hidden bonus feature associated with it, which is kind of cool. If one of your files in the group that you've selected in multicam is a WAV file or an AIFF file, something that is audio only, the multicam generator knows that that's the sound that you want. It's going to mute all of the sound from the camera. So if you're trying to go through and you've got some scratch audio from the camera, you've got a, a really nice professionally recorded WAV file, uh, select camera one in this audio dialog here, oops, here, um, so that uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the setting here. Don't use all cameras. Don't use switch audio. Use camera one, and the multicam tool will know that this is uh, it's going to just use that wave file, and it'll mute all your other tracks. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And this will quickly go through and create a whole slew of multicams for me automatically. Now it is giving me a message here. It's saying that some clips could not, uh, uh, could not be synchronized. In most cases in this, I know that there are some files that don't synchronize. And most of the cases that's because these are things like uh, B-roll files that didn't have synchronized audio to begin with. But this went through and created a whole series of multicams for me. Instead of doing these one at a time, 
in one step, I've just gone through and created a whole series of multicams. So on some of the TV shows that I've seen this used for, you know, they've got 160, 200 shots that came through in a single day's dailies. Uh, you run this step one time and suddenly you've got 80 multicams. One step. It's a huge, huge time saver if you're going through and selecting a camera, selecting an audio clip, saying merge clips, doing that again and again and again and again. Plus, multicam is turnover safe, meaning, uh, again, if at the end of the process we're going to hand off the sound to somebody else to work on, we know that the metadata is going to pass through correctly. Okay. One last step that I want to touch on with the multicam side of things here. If I am working with uh, these multicam files, we're going to go ahead and just uh, bring this back down here. And I'm going to open up one of these multicam files here in my source monitor. And we'll just double check the sync. Make sure that that looks good on both the A and the B camera. Yep, it looks like the clapboard is, is lined up properly. A um, couple of quick things on multicam. You may or may not be aware of this if you're new to Premiere. Uh, if you right click on a multicam group, you can choose to open this in a timeline view. And this is an easy and quick way to double check and make sure that in the timeline view, everything lined up properly. All of the different shots lined up correctly. There's nothing missing from the multicam. And it also gives you the ability to go in and add things to the multicam view as necessary. So this, uh, this workflow is also you know, pretty bulletproof if you do need to go back and reset and recheck sync across multiple files. Um, and that's another big benefit of working with um, multicam over something like merge clips, where you're kind of locked in. So here's a good example of a multicam with the WAV file has come across. Here's the A camera and the B camera. If I need to nudge things around, I can easily do that just using the uh, controls within this timeline view. When I close the timeline, if I've already edited this someplace else, those changes are going to ripple across. Now I'm gonna create a sequence to edit some of this footage in, and I'll just use kind of a standard sequence format here. And let me bring in one of these multicam shots that we've created. This is a good looking one here. I've got all my audio. And if I bring this clip in, I'll just mark an endpoint, and we'll just use the drag and drop method to bring this in. You'll notice that this comes in with all five channels of audio. Now, some editors might want all five channels of audio to come in at all, five all the time. Um, in most cases, most of the editors that I work with typically only want to have one of those channels to kind of cut with. Uh, one channel that's recorded might be a master mix, or there might be uh, one channel is the, the overall boom microphone. That's gonna be what I predominantly wanna cut a scene with, and I don't wanna have to see all five of these audio channels. There's an easy way to do that. And if you use this methodology, it also enables the editor, if you do need to go back and get to those audio channels, you can. You can match frame into it, and uh, you can actually bring up all the different audio channels, preview them, and then cut something else in as needed. So the way this looks, I'm simply going to go in and select, and I can do this again as a batch, and that's part of the brilliance of this, is I can go in and select as many of these multicams as I want in my bin, right-click, modify, audio channels, and when I do this, I can see that, again, these files have five channels of audio. I don't want to edit with five channels to begin with. I only want one channel. And by doing this, I can select whichever channel of those five channels that I want to cut with. If the boom mic was on audio five, I can select A5 here. If it's on A1, I can check the box for A1. Hey, and Carl, once I could you, the, uh, would yeah. you consider zooming in a little so people can see that a little bit better? Oh. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. So here we can see that a little closer. What I have done is change this number from five, which is what it had from the multicam group, to one channel. 
you can see all of that extra complexity goes away. And now I can just cut with the mono microphone of my choosing here and set that up. So if I just want to cut with A1, I can just select A1 here. I'll zoom back out so I can click OK. And now for any of these, these multicam groups, when I go through and drag and drop this in, it's keeping the file really nice and neat, uh, just a single audio track as I'm going through and uh, doing cuts with this. And if you're used to using the insert and overwrite buttons, and you're used to using these track targeting commands, again, you can see this only has V1 and A1 to cut in. It doesn't have A1 through A5 to cut in. Um, now, if I need to get into this and actually work with the individual audio, and I want to uh, match frame into this and see all of the audio, this is a little, it's not tricky, but it just takes a moment to understand. Hold down the option key, double click on the audio track and then with the audio selected press your match frame audio key and by doing this it's going to load in all of the audio sources into your source monitor and now you have all of the different audio tracks to work with and with the source monitor selected if i bring up my audio tracks over here, you can see that I'm getting waveforms on all the different tracks here. So at this point, I can start to think about and solo each of these different tracks, preview which one I want to cut in, so that if I wanted to cut in A5, I can come in here and just choose A5 is the only source that I want to cut in, and I want to have it overwrite at this location. And so now when I cut that in, it's going to replace, I'll zoom in here so that you can see this. We'll kind of step in a little bit so that you can see this. This has actually replaced the A1 audio with the A5 audio. So again, working with multicam, it's, it's an important part of the process. Um, when it comes to doing actual turnovers, if I've got an edit that I've been working with and I actually have to turn this over for sound, let's say, um, the recommended workflow for doing that is to actually use a file format called an AAF, Advanced Authoring Format is what that stands for. Um, when I choose AAF in the File Export menu, this is going to very quickly flatten down the timeline. It'll flatten any instances of multicams on my timeline. You don't actually see it happen, but it ensures that the original metadata for the sound, the original metadata for the picture ends up in that AAF file. So if I had different matching sound time code, if I had um, other notes and information, all of that will end up in the export that I send out for doing my audio turnovers. Jason, how are we looking as far as questions? Um, that's kind of what I wanted to cover today. Yeah. Was, uh, just kind of get into some of these workflow questions and uh, uh, see if anybody had any interesting uh, uh, questions about how all this comes together. Yeah, no. Um, I think everybody's kind of very much in awe as to what you're doing, particularly when you just started with the ALE file. I mean, that's something which um, I haven't covered on stream, and I know people have been asking more about just – better ways and better practices for using metadata. Everything else has been kind of uh, uh, random side questions. So I've been kind of hitting those. Anyone in the meantime, while we've still got Carl, got any specific questions around this stuff? Now, of course, you'll be able to watch the replays here. And we're hoping to make this a regular thing, me and Carl together mm -hmm. on the stream. So if there are any particular uh, workflows, whether they're film, television, or Hollywood based, specifically, be sure to ask them, you know, you can hit me up on Twitter at Beetlejace. Um, and uh, and oh, we, go ahead, we've Carl. got a, I, just a couple of quick things. Um, we are actually in the process of writing sort of a, a best practices for film and television document. Um, this is something that's going to live, um, you know, on one of the Adobe sites as we uh, and we're going to continue to refresh this as the software updates. 
So we're in the process of putting that together now. So everything that I covered is actually in the dailies chapter of that document. And uh, again, it'll be something that people can reference in the near future. So Carl, you've got a question from uh, Vincent Schilling on YouTube. What's the most complicated workflow that you've worked on that this technique did well with? So I'm assuming that's going to be, it could be perhaps the film that I'm uh, showcasing here on my shirt. I'm, I'm using one of our one of our big wins with Premiere Pro, which was Deadpool from a couple years ago, but you've worked on tons, Absolutely. Of our, tons of our Hollywood films. This is just such a standard practice that, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the ones that uh, that did, didn't use this type of technique. Um, you know, generally speaking, any time that you're working in a situation where you have, uh, you've hired somebody called a DIT, a digital imaging technician. This is a job that we see people do, and their primary job is to get those memory cards from the camera, and it's their lifeblood to make sure that those files stay safe. They get duplicated and copied and sent off, but they also go through the process of creating the editing media by baking in color, um, adding different uh, metadata information. So this ALE workflow is, it's a standard in Hollywood um, in, in film and television that I've seen it on TV shows like The Good Doctor. I've seen it on uh, movies like uh, Dolomite is My Name. The new Terminator movie used ALE files as a, the, the dailies workflows that came in. You know, and there you're talking about, you know, they had something over 200 days of shooting. So that's right. 200 times they had to go through this process with dailies. And if you can just imagine having to manually go in, if you've got, you know, 80 shots a day coming in and the editor is sitting in the other, the, the lead editor is sitting in the other room waiting like, hey, what do I have to cut today? Um, you know, you've got to get those files prepped. You've got to get them ready. You've got to get them synced. Uh, Multicams have to be created and they have to be moved over into uh, scene bins so that they're organized for the lead editor. And uh, if you had to do all of that work manually and you had to do each multicam manually, it never, it, you would never get done. Um, right. So that's where this step, um, it saves you a lot of time overall in that daily, in that early uh, stages of a film workflow but it also ensures that at the end of the process, um, everything goes according to plan. And uh, that's the area that I see, you know, you, you don't have to do all these, these steps. You don't necessarily need an ALE file if all you're doing is delivering to YouTube. Um, right. But um, if you're somebody who is an independent filmmaker, you know, Sundance just got done. There's a lot of people out there that, uh, you know, had films that were picked for Sundance. And when something like that happens and they get distribution, um, you know, very, very famously, uh, Robert Rodriguez shot El Mariachi for something like $7,000. And um, nobody hears the sound mix that he initially did when he did that $7,000 movie. They hear the right. $600,000 mix right. that was done um, once the film got distribution and everybody said, hey, this is really awesome. We want to actually take this and give it a real theatrical release and we're going to buy it from you. And, uh, you know, that's where we really need to get this information out more because, you know, I have had some stories of people that, you know, cut a film and did really, really well with it, got distribution from a major studio. And when they found uh, it was time to actually do like a re remix the sound, they found that the files they created wouldn't translate across and it involved mm -hmm. you know getting a team of editors to come in and kind of overcut some of this stuff you know mm -hmm. recut the audio in premiere so that they could uh, send it out and um you know it's it's not a uh, it's not a limitation of premiere it's just every nle has multiple ways of dealing with syncing sound every nle has multiple ways of dealing with metadata it's right. just there's a right way of doing it so that it turns over to uh easily to some of these other post houses. Right. So the edit doctor has got a question for you on Twitter Periscope uh, regarding AAF. So this kind of falls into that. So she's saying, so the AAF does include all the original audio. In other words, after the edit, is Carl saying the AAF includes the original disabled audio tracks as well? Um, it does. What it does, if you followed this process correctly, the when you export out an AAF file, um, by default, we include the audio that comes from your timeline. We basically make new media for you, and all of that gets put into the AAF folder. Um, if you choose the option for, um, if you choose the option to make it a linked audio situation, in other words, an AAF file can contain all of your audio media and make just a really, really big self-contained AAF file. 
Um, you don't want to typically do that. You want to use the link media option um, because when you do that, what will happen is um, the external audio will come in as either AIFF or WAV files. So all get dumped into the same exact folder. Um, this method that I'm showing you here, what this will do is it will give you all of the tracks that are used in the timeline. But since the metadata matches back to the original source media, um, it's a fairly easy step for the audio post person to go in and say, I don't want this to link to just that single track wave file. We're going to link it to the five track original wave file. And then you will get access to uh, all the additional tracks that maybe weren't cut in the, uh, in the original timeline. And all that's right. where this has a lot of power. So uh, here's another thing sort of based around the ALE list. So Vincent Schilling is asking here. So he says, I guess the thing I'm concerned with is an error. So a human error that possibly a PA might be assisting with missing a line or two. How easy is it to perhaps find an error if there is a conflict in the ALE list? Is it, I mean, is it at that yeah. point, if there's an error, does it just not link up to the content or, I mean, I guess it's, we're, it's kind of manual at that point for us. Yeah. Um, you know, typically if the, uh, um, if the ALE file, um, and we're talking about like the, being the typed only... in Excel, right? So they're, they're, they're missing right. some data in the Excel spreadsheet and it gets exported that. So the ALE itself is fine, but there's something, there's a line missing or a, or a, a field missing. Um, well, in, if if it's a if it's a complete column that ends up missing, um, typically it's you know that's one of the reasons why we have the option to go in and choose to update the metadata because you know that's the type of thing that you can use the update metadata effect or use the update metadata menu choice in the clip menu um, to point at a new updated ALE file that actually is missing that metadata, and that's a common thing that happens is uh, you know you get an ALE file and and you know, Excel isn't the the only place where you can create one of these ALE files. You can create one in Premiere. You can create one in most of the DIT tools out there. So any type of tool that is designed to kind of process files, add a color to them, um, generally speaking, they can export out the ALE file at the same time. So we see a lot of different tools out there. Um, I work with some really, you know, some kind of specialty tools here in Hollywood from uh, from some of the companies like Lightiron or from uh, 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 Photochem. You know, they have their own specialty tools that the DIT uses, but there's a lot of other tools out there. You know, some uh, Blackmagic has a tool. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other tools out there that can be used for uh, that initial generation of ALE files. And it, it just, it's usually something that's how handled by the DIT where they can kind of merge that information together um, or even provide a kind of a template uh, spreadsheet that can then be opened up in a, uh, a spreadsheet editor and make the changes. And that way it'll preserve the formatting properly. Nice. Um, nice. All right, man. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, and everyone's saying, okay, thanks. Makes a lot of sense. Encouraging. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, as always, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you want to see more of these collaborative streams with really the best workflows in the biz coming from one of the many amazing people that I get to work with who is actually doing this stuff every day in Los Angeles with all the filmmakers out there. Um, let us know. Let me know on Twitter. Let us know in the comments here on YouTube and Facebook, uh, uh, Behance and elsewhere. So as always, you'll be able to watch the replays on all of the various platforms right after we stop, including well, actually many of them you can watch right away now. Um, and we're going to try and make this weekly thing. So we'll be back next Thursday. We've already got some topics in mind, but if you've got some other stuff that you want to see or you want Carl to show, let me know on Twitter. That's where I pick a lot of the topics from. And until then, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.